All right, committee, welcome back to the second part of the first day. Um, we're only about four hours behind. But up next is Director Reiner from the Wyoming Department of Transportation with um, some exciting news about federal money coming into Wyoming and how we can most best spend it to meet our needs in regards to electric, electric vehicles. So welcome, Director Reiner, to Corporations. Uh, always happy to have you here. Well, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. For the record, uh, my name is Luke Reiner, Director of YDOT, and with me today is Mr. Jesse Kirkmeyer, who is our really strategic planner and has worked hard on this plan. Maybe just in terms of setting the stage, and now I'm going to I'm going to kick it over to Mr. Kirkmeyer. Is I think my task and purpose today is to really to quickly update you on our NEVI plan or the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Plan. It is currently posted on our website for public comment. So, uh, so it's, it's out there and, and we are receiving comments. And, uh, and so we'll, we'll brief you uh, on the details uh, here in just a sec. Just a couple talking points uh, from my level uh, of, the, of the state. First, um, this is certainly part of the IDJA or the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. And, and fully in about the next five years, receiving about $24 million the task and purpose of which is to install charging stations in the state in, to support uh, EVs. The, the plan is due the 1st of August, and, and we're certainly on track to meet uh, that deadline. No money from IJA can be spent on this until our plan is approved by the U.S. Department of Transportation. So, so we're looking good there. As we prep this plan, we did, we did traverse the state. We had 11 public meetings and that were well attended and the input was good. And certainly we used uh, that, that input to adjust the plan. Key talking points in, in this space for us. One is a uh, wide out or we in the state value choice. We do not care what you drive, but if you want to drive an electric vehicle, our task that the Department of Transportation is to ensure that our infrastructure, you know, facilitates your choice. And, and the other key talking point that we just talked about is remember, the state's second largest industry is tourism. And there's a nice lady in Iowa who wants to bring her electric vehicle to Wyoming and go see Devil's Tower or Yellowstone or Teton or Thermopolis. And so our task there is really to support uh, that portion of our economy, tourism, and, and get people in. With that, um, please stop us as we go, but I'll turn it over to Mr. Kirkmeyer with your permission to, to rapidly brief the plan. Sure. Thank you, Director. And Mr. Kirkmeyer, there is a handout committee that came out this morning. It's blue. I assume that's what you're working off of. You're walking through, Mr. Kirkmeyer? Yeah, yes, Mr. Chairman. But but to be honest, I'm just going to focus on the two maps, the second second page and then the second to the last page. <clears throat> and I'll talk the other points and you have them for your background, but I'm not gonna go through the slides. I'm just gonna talk uh, based upon the maps. Thank you. So um, kind of describing this problem, this NEVI program problem for a, from Wyoming's perspective, the federal government issued the NEVI guidance 90 days after the law passed in February. And it was very specific with regards to how this money could be used. It had to be used on DC fast charging stations the stations had to be located first along alternative fuel corridors. And in Wyoming, that's our three interstates. And you'll see those uh, um, pictated on the map, the three interstates. The stations had to have four ports, each port capable of at least 150 kilowatt charge. And the station had to be able to use all four ports at the same time, which requires a six, 600 kilowatt capability of the local infrastructure. The, port, the stations could be no more than 50 miles apart and no more than one mile from the interstate. Um, that presented us with a unique challenge. The first was the, the location of the stations and their frequency. These stations run about a million dollars to purchase and install. And then our estimates suggest that they could be in the hundred to $200,000 a year range to provide operational support to them. So that's very expensive. The other problem we had with the design that the federal government put out is we had to put everything on the interstates first and those had to be deemed as built out by the Secretary of Transportation, uh, Department of Transportation at the US level before we could move any available funding off those corridors or off the interstates to support stations being built elsewhere. 
as the director stated, our number one priority here is tourism visits. When we look at the level of uh, folks in Wyoming that actually own these vehicles, it's around 500, certainly not enough to support the level of infrastructure required for us to install in this bill. So really we're aiming at that out of state tourist that's either driving through the state or coming to the state that wants to visit one of the tourist areas. Unfortunately, the design of the program um, put in such a, a, a strict requirement of us to put so many of these very expensive stations so close together that th we had no hope of them ever being economically feasible. So to put it uh, to put it another way, we've determined that we have about six thousand day miles a day driven on Wyoming's highways and interstates by out of state EV traffic. About six thousand miles a day. Of that, seventy nine percent are Teslas. Teslas have their own charging network and they're proprietary. So Tesla cars don't go anywhere else but Tesla charters typically. Other EVs, the other 21% can't use Tesla stations. They have to use a public facing station and that's what the NEVI money is for. So we have about 6,000 miles a day driven by out of state EV travelers on our highways and our roadways. About 1,500 of that are the non-Tesla vehicles. In, if we built our system out the way the federal government wants it built every 50 miles and one mile from the interstate, we actually need about 150,000 miles a day driven by non-Tesla EVs on our interstates in order for any one of these stations to be financially viable. So we knew right away that that, that, was, that wasn't going to work for us. So what we decided instead was to develop a holistic state plan that would finish off kind of the interstates that lack station uh, support right now, and then rapidly move that funding with the approval of the US Department of Transportation to additional routes that support movement from the corridors, which are our interstates, to the parks, which are where, where folks from out of state are visiting. So then when you look at the, at the map in front of you, you're gonna see the corridors bit, um, dictated or dictated a certain way. We have to finish building out those first. Then we selected an additional five routes to get folks from the interstates to the parks. And you'll see those noted there. We originally used three criteria to develop those route recommendations. The first was which of the roads from the interstates to the parks had the highest daily vehicle mile average. From that, you can infer that's also the highest daily vehicle EV mile average. <clears throat> those are the routes that, that popped up as the highest, highest traveled routes. The second criteria was you'll see the shaded counties and you'll see the reservation. It's a blue shade and the other counties are kind of a pinkish or orangey shade. Those were determined to be justice 40 counties in, in the NEVI program guidance. Those are the counties where we have to, or we have our goal is to spend 40% of the entire funding in those counties. So we selected routes that went through those counties to make sure we supported those areas, specifically where the county itself was not already on a corridor. And then the third reason um, that we looked at this was, well, what do we think our friends at the Office of Tourism think about our route selection? And they reviewed the route selection. They said, yeah, you guys picked the, the best routes to get, to get folks from the corridors to, to the areas where out-of-state tourists would travel. So that, those were our route recommendations. They're not prioritized, but we, we, we certainly identified those as the next step. Once we finish off the corridors and get those built out, then we'll wanna focus on the routes to get folks from the corridors to the parks. Another thing you'll note in this map is there's some black numbers in there. Those are the numbers of registered EVs in that county. And what you can quickly see is it doesn't add up to a lot. It's about 500. And of that 500, 350 or so are Tesla. And Tesla has its own charging network. So we're again, we're really not building this to enable Wyomingites that currently have the technology to move around. We're really building this at least initially until it's adopted higher in the state, if it ever is for those out-of-state tourists. Any questions before I go on to the second map? Okay, just maybe one point of clarification. So Justice 40, you heard that comment. That's a federal, man, that's a federal issue. Those we had no saying in what counties uh, were established for that. So it's all federal guidance and, and the federal government picked those locations. Go ahead. All right, Mr. Chairman, thank you. 
So the next map kind of shows our plan in its entirety as we're presenting it. Of course, it's written out in about 40 some pages if you go pull it off the website and read it. But what it, what it uh, shows is where we recommend we place stations based upon the realities of the situation, the economics, the environment, the geography, the demographics in Wyoming. And um, what it shows you is we don't, we don't intend to put one of these large Nevi stations every 50 miles, no, no more than one mile from an interstate along our, our, our interstates. Where we currently have, or we know there is a planned charging station, either at Electrify America or Tesla, we are asking that that counts for a location in, in that area. Now, Tesla is currently proprietary. They're only allowed for Tesla use, but Tesla has announced that they are going to make their stations public facing so any EV can use it. So we are going to ask that those stations count and we don't have to put another station there. Any station located next to another station just kind of pulls away the amount of revenue and station visits that are required. Uh, another way of putting this is these stations, these big stations, need between 36 and 72 visits a day to cover costs. Our current estimate is based upon traffic is each one of these stations, if we built it out to the Navi specifics, which would put about 22 of them on our interstates, would they would get about 0.4 visits a day. And we don't project that they would hit the 36 a day visit threshold until about 2042. Um, so for us economically, we would be putting money into a system that was built to fail. And, and we really don't think that's wise. It's not a wise use of um, taxpayer money. And, and again, federal, this is federal money. There it will be no state money used on this. The federal government does allow uh, up to an 80% match for whomever decides to put one of these stations in. For our purposes, that matching money will either be private or lo local jurisdiction if a municipality or a county decides they want to, want to um, get involved in, in <clears throat> using one of these stations. So the four areas that we've uh, located stations that currently do not have a large powered station, either Tesla or Electrify America, are Sundance, Buffalo, Douglas, and Pine Bluffs. And those are the only four stations that we are proposing that we build to the NEVI standard. And that is the four by 150 kilowatt with uh, four ports and capable of simultaneous operation. Um, we, we estimate that will roughly cost be around seven to $8 million for both purchase support and up to the five year operational support that we can provide the station owner to help them cover costs. But even then, um, we estimate that a station owner of one of those four Nevi stations will be in the hole between five and eight hundred thousand dollars after about a decade, um, and, and so it, it will be challenging for a Wyoming business owner um, to put one of those stations in. So we really kind of expect it will be a large national company that will probably propose to build those four stations out. Um, so if they accept our plan and, and they accept the fact that we are going to count the stations uh, that are already in place and put these four additional chain uh, stations in, that will really trigger us to have the ability to then open up the funding and then build those routes out that I, that I showed you on the first map. And, and kind of we'll use the same process. We'll select a route, we'll issue a request for proposal, and we'll ask for folks to put in their proposal on how they will build uh, the station route from the, the interstate to the park or wherever the ending of that route is. In, in this case of, of Highway 85, it goes from Cheyenne up along 85 and, and then ends up up here in Sundance and up here in this area. So that, and, and those stations we're making the assumption will not have to be those big expensive stations, cost a lot of money to buy and cost a lot of money to operate. We'll let the local jurisdiction and or business decide what works best for that, their area. So they may put in a series of much smaller stations a long way to get folks from, from say Casper to Shoshone and then from Shoshone up to Cody or Shoshone over to, over to um, Jackson. Um, and that's we we think is the best chance that this money that we're getting from the federal government has in actually producing a system that will work for us now and in the future, 
um, and has the best chance of being financially or economically viable in the state. Now, just recently, as, as recently as yesterday, we did secure the National Park Service's um, um, approval of writing us a letter of support um, in exchange for agreeing to fund vendors within the park themselves that are willing to put these stations in. So I, I believe that if the federal government does approve our plan of the four stations and then gives us the exception to policy for the rest, the other 18, so we don't have to put them in and we can use that money off corridor, we'll be, we'll be much better postured to get folks from corridors to the parks. And then once they're actually in the parks, in and around. And with that, I'll just sit back for any questions. Questions for Mr. Kermeyer at YDOT. Uh, Representative Burt first, and we'll go to Lebeau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you, gentlemen, for, for coming in and presenting again. I heard this through the Transportation Committee and for full disclosure, I haven't been on board with this ever since it's been proposed, even though I understand the intent of trying to reach out to those that are, are driving electric vehicles to come into the state. When it says that you got a 20% matching, uh, a couple of different things that kind of struck me is the local municipalities are already struggling. Me locally in my local community, we're trying to figure out how to fund emergency vehicles, right? The funding isn't there for essential services that we're looking at. And we're talking about a 20 year projection before we can even get to the point where we can make money. So I'm not quite sure if we're actually going to see a big national come through. I guess my big question is, instead of trying to, you know, work on trying to spend 25 million of, of free federal money, which is never free, do we actually have to take the 25 million or can we just not even implement this until it becomes to the point where we can actually say it's going to be profitable? And if, if you'd answer that, and then if nobody decides to partner with us, what happens? Does it just go away as well? Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative Burt. Um, so in the NEVI program guidance, if the state fails to execute the funding, the money rolls to the Federal Highway Administration. And the second step is then the Federal Highway Administration offers the money in state first. If the money is then failed to, to, to be executed in, in that same state, then it is offered up to other states. But just to make sure, Representative Burt, the 20% matching, your, it, can be, it can be local jurisdictional. It can also be private. And then the second thing, if you're not in a community if you're not in a community wanting to bid for one of the big high powered stations, let's say you're in Lander or Warland and you just want one port and that one port has a 50 kW charge because you want folks to stay there and eat at your restaurant, then, then your, your, your cost of your, your initial cost and your operational cost is significantly lower. And, and so you're not faced with that kind of economic challenge. So there are, the way we're presenting this is there are methodologies um, to cushion and or reduce that front end and long-term economic end. And of course, you don't have a 20 year payback in that case. You have a much, you might have almost immediate payback depending upon the size of station you put in and how many ports you put in. So just to clarify, if we don't do this and nobody partners with us, that 25 million just goes to the federal highway fund and still gets sent to Wyoming and we arguably could be putting it to better use. Mr. Chairman, that's correct. Yep, I, I would add maybe one comment to uh, what Mr. Crookmeyer said on these smaller stations. You'll see on the map that there's actually some blue stations with some dashes around them. Um, so that would be in our mind, a phase two smaller station along our corridors that's not four station, that's again, is more cost economical and to help alleviate uh, th this mileage issue. But, but just to be clear, you know, our suggestion to the federal government is, we don't think it's a good idea to put them in every 50 miles. And, and we have asked for an extensive number of waivers um, in that regard. And Mr. Chairman, I, I just wanna make sure it's clear. The NEVI funding has to be used on these stations. So whether we use it, we manage the process, or it rolls to the federal highway and they manage it, they can't take that 25 million and spend it on something else. Then they got to spend it on these. And if they don't spend it on these in Wyoming, I'm sure Texas or California or Florida would be happy to take our $25 million. Do you have follow-up, Representative Burt? 
Member Lebeau. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I guess going back into that, uh, another question I have is, if even in the, on the lowest spectrum of what it would cost, if we do get a partner or an, in, an individual business takes over and, and puts in even the smallest one to where the projected where they can make a dollar back, what happens if long term after the 25 spent, we put these stations in there, say we get a national, everybody backs out because it's not profitable within a, within a good ROI time frame. Do these, what happens to them then after the, after the infrastructure has been built and these are in there, then, then what happens? Do they, somebody else take over them? Do we just shut the power off? I mean, a Mr. Questions. Chairman, Representative Bird, excellent question. I've asked it myself and, and I've gotten, I have not received an answer. So I made an assumption in the plan. And the assumption in the plan is the state has no responsibility to recoup the money. If the business that gets, as long as they complied with the front end agreement and put in the station properly, and if after the five years of operational support, the business fails, it's if the federal government wants to get the money back from the business, they do so. But, and, and I just put that assumption in uh, because they just, I, we have not gotten that. And it's also, it was not, it was also not addressed in the notice of proposed rule that came out earlier this week. So it, it's unknown. So we made the assumption that we're out of that. That's between the federal government and the station owner. Okay. Representative LeBeau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a question in regard to this Wyoming state recommendation, the map here. Um, did you take the reservation into consideration as far as uh, Tesla charging station? Because I see um, nothing identified here that outside of Riverton, uh, we have our internet, one River internet company, and they have some Teslas, and there is a charging station right when you enter Riverton. Mr. Chairman, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman Representative Lebeau, uh, Tesla stations only count in this network if they're the supercharger stations. So those are the nine on the interstates, and then the two that are not on the interstates is, is one's in Jackson and one's in Lusk. So there are additional Tesla level two chargers or smaller than 150 kilowatt uh, per hour level three chargers. Those are not on here because Nevi is really focused on the higher powered, faster charging station. So that's why they're not shown because Tesla has not put, if you have one that's not on this map, Tesla isn't reporting it to us or the federal government that they have a supercharger in that area, unless it's just come online recently. Any other questions? Representative Roscoe. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Kirkmeyer, can you tell me if, uh, if, a, if Wyoming is a, <clears throat> is a problem with national uh, transportation for electric vehicles? So crossing Wyoming, is it, it's currently, is it a problem of not having enough stations? And, and the second question, if I could, um, do you know when Tesla might be changing over their station to make them public? Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Representative Roscoe, uh, to answer your first question, most Tesla or owners, er, all everyone would like better coverage in Wyoming, uh, simply because in some of our environmental conditions, especially in the winter, uh, it could be challenging to get from one station to another because they don't get their you know projected 200 or 250 mile range. However, Tesla's put in a network that seems to, seems to accommodate the 79% of the market share that they own, and they're doing it with nine stations on the interstate. The NEVI program wants us to put in upwards of 22 for the remaining 21%, and you can see how economically that just does not work for any station owner and won't work for a long time. Um, the two off corridor stations that Tesla owns. And anecdotally, I've heard that th both of those are very well visited and probably the most visited by Tesla owners. Um, as far as the other stations, Electrify America has just started putting them in. They've only activated uh, the one, I think, in Gillette and one in Evans or in, in uh, um, Southwest corner. Um, Evanston, yeah, Evanston, because there's also one in Evansville. Uh, Evanston, they're putting they're putting one in Cheyenne. Um, Electrify America is the VW company, uh, partially owned by Siemens, and they're really their market is the other 21% because the tes Tesla network is currently proprietary. Their goal is to get a station every 120 miles 
our plan is puts a station less than less than that. Um, and if you look at Tesla's breakdown, they're certainly in that same 120 to 150 mile range. So we would actually improve that coverage. Uh, it probably wouldn't be the best for some of the smaller, older EVs. But the newer ones that will come that are coming out, unless something dramatic happens, it should it should support them. Now, with regards to Tesla and making their network public, I've been in contact with their governor or the government uh, liaison as early as last month, and she still assured me they're planning on doing that very quickly. But she wouldn't give me a date. Our plan does rely upon the assumption those will go public facing, but if they don't. That really only adds three more locations where we would need to put a station. We need to put one in Laramie, one in Wheatland, and one in Sheridan. And so we could still accomplish what was there. And I, th I think with the three additional stations, that still leaves us plenty of money to fund the routes to the, in, to the parks. Any further questions? Representative Burt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, sorry for the delay. I had to look some things up here. So in a, in a previous committee meeting, uh, can, you, can you give me a breakdown of what the, is there still the possibility of using the, any money from the VW settlement fund? Is that state money or is that federal money that we could use at the state? Because in that, it, it gives you ability for developing zero emissions charging. In a previous pre, uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation, it has one of the actual funding mechanisms, but I don't see it in this, this documentation here for, for the funding side of that. So clarification, please. Let's go back. Mr. Chairman, Representative Burt, uh, yes, sir, you're correct. This, this is the briefing on the NEVI plan. The VW settlement money is currently held at the Department of Environmental Quality. It's a result of the VW settlement. That is separate money. We have full control of that. That is not NEVI plan money. It's a different pot. Uh, that money will be used to supplement this plan and make sure we cover areas that aren't addressed in this plan. And that's specifically what we would use the, the VW settlement money for. We would aim that pot of money um, at level two, multi, multi uh, port level two for like apartment complexes, condominiums, large shopping centers, and or smaller level, le uh, smaller level three chargers for businesses that want uh, to supply that capability, but also encourage people to visit. And we would also focus on awarding that money in areas not identified in the NEVI plan, the corridors and the routes identified there. So in locations away from that. Okay, Senator Scott, coming in from remote, the floor is yours. Mr. Chairman, uh, very simple question, uh, what's, a typical charge cost the motorist and how much of that uh, typically would wind up uh, going to the operator of the station? Go ahead. Senator and, and Mr. Chairman and Senator, um, that question is difficult to answer and I've asked it a number of times to, to different companies and operators. And it is determined by the cost of the station, the relationship between who builds or owns the station and where the station is located and the utility rates secured by the owner operator and the local utility. And eventually taxation will have a, a, a vote in there. Um, generally, however, a car, these cars wanna get to about an 80% charge. Because uh, after 80%, the battery gets too hot and they actually significantly slow down. So, so if the vehicle is, you know, 10 or 20% charge, you pull off the interstate, you plug it in at, at a an 150 kilowatt port, it takes about 25 minutes for that 20, 25 minutes for that vehicle to get to about an 80% charge. And again, depending upon the local utility rates, the, the profit the owner operator wants, this the the electricity rates offered by the utility, because especially in a low use station, utility rates can vary dramatically uh, based upon the demand. Um, you're, you, you, most folks report that they are paying less for, for that 80% charge uh, than they are currently paying for gasoline. And in some cases about half because gasoline has gone up so much. 
prior to the rise in gasoline prices, it was pretty, it was on par, it was parity. But again, that's, that's an average because vehicles are getting bigger batteries, which charge more and hold more charge and go further. And then um, as the, as the, the system, as the systems come out, they're becoming more efficient and more effective. What, what, Go ahead. Ms. Ms. Chairman, Paul, what percentage goes to the owner operator of the station? Could you repeat that one more time, Senator Scott? What percentage goes to the owner operator of the station? Go ahead, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Chairman, Senator Scott, whatever percentage the station owner, based upon his economics, he or she keeps, it, they would keep a higher percentage, of course, if they owned, bought the, the, the charter outright and owned it, uh, they would keep a lower percentage uh, based upon whether a larger company put it in, they'd make that arrangement. And then um, of course, the, the local arrangement they make with the utility and the cost of the electricity they're actually pushing into the battery cost them would have a very large effect to the amount of, of profit and or revenue they would keep personally. Any further questions? So at this time, is there anything you need from us, Director Reiner, statutorily? You just know that public comment period is currently open and if we get some comments on electric vehicles. This is what's going on in the street. Mr. Chairman, at this point, I think we're good statutorily and, and really it's an information update. We'd look forward to comments on the plan and, and, and you know, we'll look forward to, to the next steps. All right. Thank you for coming all the way to Hewlett. Appreciate Thank your time. You. Committee, if you have any questions on the plan, some of the other slides, certainly talk to the Department of Transportation. It's always nice, I guess, to get federal money, I suppose, even when we can't spend it appropriately like they want us to. With that, let's go to telecom. And the Wyoming Telecom Act is up for sunset. There's some, been some various conversations if we should just let it go into the sunset, if we should keep it alive. We need to amend it some. Hey, Mr. Kaysen, did you want to talk before we talk telecom? Oh. Yeah, we can talk electricity now. I guess if you want to, before we get to the telecom, the PSC is kind of stuck here no matter what, because all these issues fall under them. But if there are other electrical issues we should talk about, come on board and we'll hold telecom for just a bit. Welcome back. And so audience, if anybody else has thoughts on electricity not related to telecom or other PSC functions, um, you want bill drafts or to approach the committee during a public comment on electric <coughs> rates or electric in general, um, now would be the time before we break from the telecom matching. But with that, welcome to okay. Rocky Mountain Power. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Rick Kaysen once again with Rocky Mountain Power and I, I appreciate uh, your indulgence on this, but I, I think it is, it's relative. Uh, with me also to my right uh, is a gentleman by the name of Thomas Tom McCar excuse me, Carter. He is a member of our, our team. He is the new uh, government affairs director. And um, you will see be see more of his presence in Wyoming over the, the coming months and years, hopefully. So but what we wanted to do is steal, steal a couple of very quick minutes uh, as related to the discussion earlier about carbon capture, utilization, and storage. Um, and uh, wanted to share this is the same information that we shared with Joint Minerals, but since this was a topic of discussion for your committee, I uh, thought it would be very important for you to know this as well. So uh, Rocky Mountain Power Pacific Corp, we will be issuing two parallel carbon capture requests for proposals. These will be issued no later than December 31st of this year. We are targeting the fall of 2022, so we're trying to accelerate this. The bidders that uh, will be responding to the RFPs will have approximately three months to prepare their bids, and then we will anticipate a, another three months uh, to go through, do the evaluations, do the assessments, 
and see where this may take us. This three months does not include any kind of contract negotiations that may take place. The RFPs, and we talked about some of these plants earlier, <clears throat> are going to seek to build and construct a full-scale A-mine carbon uh, capture system on the Dave Johnston uh, unit number four. Dave Johnston, of course, is outside of Glenrock. And then the Jim Bridger units three and four uh, uh, in the, uh, the Rock Springs vicinity. Uh, and as we heard earlier today about uh, the Jim Bridger and Rock Springs, uh, uh, we had the regional haze issue and we're going to have a comment on that in just a little bit as well as how that's being incorporated into some of the analyses that we have to do but the objective here is for these uh, carbon capture requests for proposals is to make sure that we comply with house bill 200 and the re uh, related regulations and rules that go along with that and that that we are going to be in concert and under the decree of the the regional uh, regional haze consent decree about the units at the Jim Bridger plant. <clears throat> the procurement process will demonstrate that the installation of the carbon capture units for CCUS for both the Johnston and the Bridger units could be at a full scale uh, uh, or for either, for either of these plants or that they may be technically or not technically viable or they may or may not be economically viable as well. So this is going to be a thorough analysis that's going to be conducted so that we can, you know, be, be, be responsive to what we think is a, a part of the all above energy strategy in Wyoming as well. <clears throat> Excuse me. As you may recall, there are two, um, there are two units in North America with regards to carbon capture. One is in uh, Canada, in Saskatchewan area. The other one was the Petronova plant down in Texas. The one in Canada is still operating, but unfortunately the Petronova project is now had to be shut down because of low demand for oil and the low price of oil. Now, when it did shut down, that's when oil was hurting. Now that oil's back up, who knows whether they're gonna be bringing back that online. The reason I mentioned these two plants, because this is significant, significant uh, investments. Both of those plants, approximately $1 billion. So this, these dollars we have to take very ser seriously. Now the plant in Texas was assisted by $200 million in federal funding. If there is some federal funding out there, will we take advantage of it? Partnering with someone, I believe that you, you, can, you can count on that one. So kind of in summary, it's very important to look at the technology. That's why we want, we want to hear from the responders to the request for proposals the economic viability of operating CCUS structures, adding new equipment to 50 year old plants, again, is very, very important. Looking at our potential partners and to make sure that we might be able to get something accomplished. And then again, uh, making sure that these, uh, these plants are economically viable. And again, uh, sorry for repeating myself, but part of the economic, or excuse me, part of the above energy uh, strategy that we're looking at here in the state. Uh, with that, uh, I would like to ask Mr. Carter to perhaps address a little bit about the regional haze and, haze and another challenge we have coming in from the federal government. Surprise, surprise. Uh, welcome, <clears throat> Mr. Carter. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Tom Carter. I, as Mr. Kaysen indicated, I am the new uh, government affairs director for Rocky Mountain Power. <clears throat> I recently left the state of Utah, where I was the um, energy advisor to the governor and the executive director of the Utah Office of Energy Development. I give you that background to let you know that I am very new in this job. So there will be a lot of I don't knows to your questions, and I will get back to you to this. But to give you some, some color on some of the things we're working on now, of course, you all are, are well aware of the regional haze issues that and the pressures that the federal government is putting both on the state and, of course, on our generation assets. There is a new rule that we were able to uh, provide comments for last week. The state DEQ, we worked with with their comments, and of course, Utah has also provided comments called the ozone transport rule. This is a 700, almost 800 page rule that talks about ozone as it moves from our state here in Wyoming and how it may impact Colorado. And what 
as written what it would mean for our generation assets in the very short term. We believe that if this rule is inactive, um, it will cause a lot of pressure to keeping the lights on in the Intermountain West. And we want you guys to be made aware of this um, and, and, and maybe uh, have an opportunity to work with the DEQ as we have provided these comments saying that, you know, we have a plan and we think that good planning and good, good um, due diligence to understand what we can do here in the West to ensure that we can provide affordable, reliable, dispatchable, all of the above energy strategy uh, stays in place while the federal government is more interested in uh, making political hay or, or engaging with their um, a certain level of their constituency. So this rule, the OTR or good neighbor rule, um, makes us very nervous. We're grateful for the partnership we have with the state of Wyoming to be able to express our concerns. And uh, we are we want to be hopeful that uh, with our comments, with the comments of the DEQ, that the, the federal government will see the error of their ways. This is a rule that's been on the books for 25 years. It's been in place in the East. They've used method, Eastern methodology to put in, to try and use, uh, uh, yeah, Eastern, that came out weird. Um, Eastern methodology as it impacts generation and admissions here in the West. And we think that's flawed methodology. So we're working hard to ensure that we are able to have long-term strategic planning while well, we think the federal government is trying to push a different agenda. So we'll come and meet with you more to talk about that uh, in, the, in the weeks and months to come, but we think it's important that you have that information. Oh, the federal government. I like Eastern methodology, not liberal, not coastal, not urban, Eastern. Eastern. Okay. Any questions uh, committee on what's coming down the pike affecting our largest public utility in the state? Okay. Mr. Chairman, Mr. again, just if I may steal a couple other seconds and to address something that Senator Scott brought up earlier this morning, and that was with respect to the Dave Johnson plan. Uh, and again, uh, working for the potential carbon capture, something that you are aware of and have heard about before. And just in recent days, just the last couple of days, uh, there has been uh, additional discussion with the potential partner uh, for that carbon capture project uh, at the Dave Johnson plant. Uh, we will be getting uh, together in the near future, uh, again, back to the table, back to more discussions uh, with respect to how you know, the possibilities of getting this done and, and, and getting down to the what's, the why's, the where, the who's, how to's, and that type of thing. So again, I wanted to share that uh, for Senator Scott's benefit, as well as the rest of the committee members. And with that, sir, uh, we'll try to answer any questions you may have. I had a quick interview last month with, I think it was called Environment and Climate News or something, and talked about House Bill 200. And I must have had eight different upstarts around the country email me saying, hey, how do we uh, talk to Pacific Corps and get our technology integrated? And can we bid on these things? So if anybody contacts you, I didn't send them your way. I said you can... You know, talk to them, but there does seem to be interest of a lot of R and D out there in the country trying to figure out solutions to these problems. Um, they just don't seem to know the right way to either knock on your door or you know partner, or if they're even large scale enough to you know be on your doorstep. But right. just know that they are out there, and I do hear from them. Okay. Uh, any other uh, questions, committee, on Rocky Mountain or the Greater Pacific Core plans moving forward? Okay. I don't know if any of us attended the. Ground, uh, the kickoff last so Monday, Monday afternoon and near Medbow is a little far of a yes. drive for me this week. But Mr. Chairman, thank yep. you for that segue, if I may. But again, yes, on uh, Monday of this week, June the 27th, <clears throat> we did have groundbreaking for the uh, beginning of the construction of the 416 uh, mile energy gateway south transmission line, which is part of the overall gateway uh, transmission system and an effort to enhance the, the transmission new infrastructure to be able to, um, to deliver uh, power uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the West. Um, I mentioned the larger project, that's 2000 miles of worth of investment as well. And so uh, as we go forward with the, the Gateway South piece, that's gonna, we're gonna have about 1,325 construction jobs. They're gonna be primarily in Carbon County. 
uh, as well as in southwest Wy uh, parts of South Wy West Wyoming, we're going to be able to help integrate 2,000 megawatts of power, and that's a lot of power. You know, you, you saw a little over 5,000 total from the Public Service Commission documents, so another $2,000 of, or excuse me, 2,000 megawatts of renewable energy that, that's planned as well for the grid. So again, <clears throat> I think this is a, is a, is a very positive step for Wyoming, it's very positive for the state of Wyoming to be able to continue to generate power and be able to, um, uh, to help out our neighboring states as well with some complications, of course. But uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to share that updated news as well, sir. Representative Duncan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I brought, we brought this up in, in minerals. Um, we're always talking about how much power we're sending out. But again, I would like you to share that same report that we request of you in minerals with corporations of, you know, we would like to have, you know, some projects here in the state of Wyoming instead of um, to utilize some of that power rather than shipping all of our power outside of the state so that we can utilize some of that sales tax revenue here in the state of Wyoming so that we can have some of that revenue here versus shipping it out and not having that revenue here in the state of Wyoming. So if you could do some of that report that we were asking for in um, minerals to, to have some of that shared here. Anything else committee? Seeing none, thank you much for being here and look forward to working with you greater in the future, Mr. Carter. Okay, thank you again, sir, for the yeah. additional time. Always a pleasure, former Mayor Casey. Thank you. Um, any other electric issues anyone has they came to talk to corporations about, about electricity? Just making sure. We only have three meetings this year, so if anybody wants a bill draft or put something on our radar, now would be a most excellent time. Seeing none, let's finally move to telecom. Um, PSC, do you want up first on just an overview of the Telecom Act? Would that be fair? I know there's some other people want to talk, but Ms. yeah. Maybe remind us how many years you've been with the Public Service Commission, Mr. Petrie, and you've gone through two or three rewrites, maybe four by now, of the Telecom Act, I would imagine, in your tenure. Would that be correct? Mr. Chairman, there have been a number of revisions to the Telecommunications Act since I've been there, which is right around 20 years. Um, and so I don't know if you were prepared to just briefly speak about the Telecom Act and it's prepared to sunset. I don't know if the PSC has any specific direction on whether they want to let it sunset, if there's some specific things, if it does, we should be maneuvering. Um, but anything from your perspective that we should know on the Telecom Act sunset and maybe what you would like us to consider as it goes forward here. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, Chris Petrie, Chairman of the Public Service Commission. And we do not have uh, a commission position or proposal on this today. We did just want to give you a quick rundown on what it is that we're currently doing under the Telecom Act as it exists. And as you mentioned, it's scheduled to sunset uh, in 2023. So, and this uh, is, is not in, a, in an exactly, uh, I'm not sure I could say this is in any kind of order of importance or it, it kind of depends on your perspective. But uh, one of the things that we continue to do with telecommunications is we take applications and uh, rule on them for certificates of public convenience and necessity for local exchange service, which is your basic telecommunication service. Um, I think it was explained some years ago by Chairman Muneer as uh, at this stage, we're basically performing a, a screening function because any new entrant is by definition a competitive operator. And so it doesn't mean that we go into the full blown old time uh, rate regulation regime, we simply screen them for their financial, managerial, technical wherewithal and make sure that they're a legitimate telecommunications player that is not here to uh, play any games with Wyoming customers. So they pass some basic uh, sort of a regulatory background check and, and then if everything goes good there, they get a certificate of public convenience and necessity and they become a competitive local exchange carrier. 
another thing that we that we continue to do is administer the Wyoming Universal Service Fund. And the Wyoming Universal Service Fund uh, collects a surcharge from all telecommunications customers in the state, including uh, wireless carriers and VoIP carriers that, that we don't otherwise regulate at all. And then uh, that money, which, which is now being collected on, a, I believe it's a 2.7% surcharge, ends up collecting a little over $2 million in, in a year in this, this coming year and last year, pretty similar. Um, that money is then used for companies that meet certain criteria to hold their retail rates for basic telephone service down to the statutory uh, equivalent of a weighted average, a statewide weighted average cost of service, which is $30. And, and that's a number that was set by statute in one of the several rewrites. Um, that now uh, most recently involves, I believe 12 carriers about 24,000 lines and a little over $2 million, which the quick math says that's about a little over $80, about $83 a line, somewhere in that neighborhood on an annual basis. That's the amount of support that the customers who benefit would receive from that collection from the larger group of telecommunications carriers. So we've got one full-time position equivalent in our office. That's the administrator. And there's quite a bit of accounting and money handling that goes with that. It makes our budget look kind of strange because there's all this money that that is just passing passing through the commission's hands, but it's for this, it's for this Wyoming Universal Support payment system. Some of the other things that we do, uh, we have some some duties that are delegated federal authority. One of those is the designation and certification of eligible telecommunications carriers, those being the companies that are eligible to receive various categories of federal telecom support. And now uh, that has largely transitioned to a broadband support function. And so we've got, we've got uh, uh, some newer ETCs that are strictly in the in the broadband deployment business. We do that annually here at the commission. And so we, the designation is your initial application where you become an eligible telecommunication carrier. Then every year after that, you have to apply to be certified, come in, demonstrate that you've spent the money within the boundaries of the, of the federal programs. Um, another thing that, that we're responsible for on a, on a federal delegation is uh, interconnection agreements, which are the basically wholesale agreements between the telecommunications companies. There's some services that uh, long haul traffic and things that, that uh, only some companies have. Some of the competitive carriers rely on uh, buying wholesale elements or services from, from, the, from the existing companies. And so they have uh, interconnection agreement filing requirements. Basically, it serves to make sure that everybody else who might be interested in interconnecting with that company who's providing service is, uh, has available to them the terms that they've agreed to. And, and, and so it's kind of a most favored nation status, most, most favored nation option for, for the next company or other companies that have existing agreements. Um, we also continue to process complaints and uh, telecommunications has kind of a, a, a history of uh, a track record of, of punching above its weight for complaint generating. And, and I can't really explain it or tell you why, but we, get, we do get some complaints on telecommunications. And uh, so we, we continue to field those. You don't field them to the legislature. They just come to us. For those of you newer to the committee, we've heard many telecom complaints over the past decade there for about three years. Every meeting, we had several people coming in. and We try to draw them to ourselves, but it doesn't always work. We, we also um, 
as you know, we, we well, quality of service, we still have some, some quality of service responsibility. So that's basically connected to complaints. Usually it's, it's a quality of service issues come to us uh, basically because of customer complaints. There's other possibilities, you know, if there were a lot of outages, uh, service interruptions, that could, that could be a, a, a source of some quality of service activity. But then, then that ties to outage reporting. The commission operates a 24 by seven outage reporting telephone so that uh, the companies are required to report outages to us. And that applies to everybody from water to you know, theoretically pipelines. And we thankfully don't get many of those, but, but we, get, you know, we get notified when there's an outage that reaches a certain scale or uh, otherwise something that the company's judgment tells it we would probably like to know about. Uh, with telecom, that, that includes 911 service outages, widespread outages, long duration outages. Um, we, we get some outage inquiries on non-regulated services and we, we sort of uh, act as a liaison for some of those. This came up quite a bit at the beginning of COVID when we had various uh, internet service um, there were some interruptions. There were a few, you know, there were a few baubles while the, you know, while the suddenly drastic increase in, in the load came and we learned things like the, um, everybody having meetings on the hour all day long causes a, causes an overload or did at times. Yeah. Um, so we have it, this outage reporting function and uh, what we do with that information is we we share it assuming we get it first before they do we which isn't always true we share that information with the office of homeland security or in the governor's office the homeland security folks are able to to very quickly make sure that any local emergency services people are, are aware that that they might have a communications problem um Just a couple more things. We have we have a a relatively minor function with the North American Number Plan Administrator, numbering plan administrator, which is uh, the the designated entity that that controls the distribution of blocks of phone numbers to the companies, and uh, it may be someday, not in the too distant future, but hopefully a few years off that uh, uh, the management of these numbers could cause us to no longer have only the 307 area code. Once the total of those numbers are exhausted and it's threatened in other states like Maine and maybe other places. But so we, so we, have, we have a bit of an advisory function there. So we check some of those and make sure that, that they're actually, the companies that make these requests actually have a, a, a connection to Wyoming and authority to do business here. And they're not just running a, a phone operation in the Antilles or something like that. Um, of course, there are some utility assessment implications to the sunset of the Telecom Act because during the last major rewrite, uh, the outcome was that the wireless companies and the VoIP, like the cable companies, they continued to pay uh, OnStar and so on. They continued to pay uh, assessments, the assessment for that supports the, the budget of the commission. Um, of course, uh, and fortunately, we had a recent revision to that statutory arrangement that created the two tiered system. We, we had a flat three mil cap on intrastate utility revenues. And that was because of some, some declining revenues of, of the bigger companies. And, and it was partly a COVID phenomenon as well. Thank you, Revenue Committee. Yes, Revenue Committee uh, put, us, put us in a, in a much better spot than we would be in. 
And it also provides potentially uh, enough, well, we've, we've looked at it. And, and in the event the Telecom Act does sunset and, and there's no duties left for us to perform with telecom and then uh, you know, presuming that the assessment would then end for all telecommunications companies, um, we believe that the current arrangement provides us enough flexibility in the two-tiered uh, mill levy to continue to fund the commission's budget. Um, there's, there's one thing, and you guys, you, you're probably familiar with this. The commission, uh, I guess, about maybe two and a half years ago now, or three, depending on whether you count filing date or decision date, but a couple of years ago, the commission, two and a half years ago, the commission uh, made a finding that CenturyLink's territories, including zone, the, the non the non-core of the towns, the zone two and three, were subject to effective competition. That was a, that was involved a stipulation with uh, the Office of Consumer Advocate, I, I believe AARP, and I'm not sure if there was there were another party or two to that stipulation right now, but that provided a, a subsidized transition for customers who decided that they would subscribe to HughesNet satellite broadband with that you could uh, have voice telephone service on, on the top of. And so that is that is the state of that. All the CenturyLink territories have been relieved of, of, of all regulation other than that that applies, that little bit that applies to competitive companies. Um, there, is a, there is a provision in the act that, that basically is a clawback so that if the conditions change at some point after the commission finds that there is effective competition in, in a company's territory, then um, they could be, the, the, the company could be brought back under regulation. Of course, that's never been tested uh, or, or exercised at all, but that is, that is one of the things that would change with the complete sunset. And so, Mr. Chairman, members, that's, that's, that's all I've got. For okay. And I think now, the telecommunications. So I know the Telecom Association is perhaps going to walk us quickly through the actual act. So you're a little more aware of each provision. But if there's any questions for the PSC at this time, Senator Case. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman. I was wondering about your role in telecom vis-a-vis uh, -vis the FCC and kind of like in the areas of wholesale connection and things. I think the FCC has some jurisdiction. Um, and I'm wondering if, what would be, I hear people say we need wholesale regulation still and things like that, but I'm trying to understand whether our act provides that or whether that's the uh, federal communications statute. Go ahead, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Senator Case. Um, my understanding is that those, the, those those duties that our commission now performs are delegations. And so in the event that, that we no longer, they're not forced delegations, they're, they're uh, the authorities delegated and we take up that duty. And if we were no longer performing that duty, then I think that things like wholesale disputes between carriers, uh, ETC designations and certifications and the, and, uh, disputes between telecoms would uh, revert back to the FCC. But I'm less certain about the disputes between telecoms. I'd have to look at that, but I think that's right. May I follow up, Mr. Chairman? Um, so the follow-up would be, does that, is that ability that's in our law that you have now, that may be a good thing to keep, is that a function of our law or is that just a kind of a side I recall there being a catch-all catch statement about uh, designated federal things. Is, is that necessary for you to keep doing this or what's your thinking on that? Um, Mr. Chairman, Senator Case, my understanding is that, that the statutory delegation is required, okay. but uh, I'm not 100% certain of that. I, I believe that is, that is the case. And we have in our statutes, 
at least one place where there's a specific delegation. I recall. And then, and then there's a more of a catch-all uh, acceptance of, or it's an authorization for the commission to perform those duties under the federal delegation. So it's, it's your permission, it's the legislature's permission for the commission to take up those duties as maybe delegated by the FCC. I think that's how it works. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Senator Scott, you have the floor. Mr. Chairman, uh, I was interested in the uh, business about the, the satellite uh, provider uh, providing adequate service. And we tried that and our experience was that it's not true. Uh, that what we found was that whoever, uh, depending on who you called, if it was somebody that was expecting a call from somebody using a satellite phone and was aware of some of the latency issues, you could get through and it would work. Uh, our experience was that uh, many of the businesses were using answering systems and they didn't get a response quick enough from the caller to the latency and you simply couldn't get through to them. The only way you could could uh, reach that business was to call somebody else who had regular landline service and have them call the business and say, we're trying to call, so-and-so is trying to call you, can you call them back? Uh, we found that was particularly uh, unsuccessful. And so in those areas where the cell phone service is inadequate, uh, landline is still an essential thing and still is competitive. And, and I think that we do need to retain the uh, uh, the ability in the Telecommunications Act for some regulation in that area. Uh, and, and I would ask the, the PSC, have you heard that problem from others or is, was there something wrong with the way things were here, but we were simply unable to use the satellite phone. Mr. Petrie, go ahead. Mr. Chairman and Senator Scott. Um, as Senator Scott's is not the only report of uh, a less than, less than satisfactory result for some, some customers. So the, the results varied. However, we did have some follow-on proceedings to the commission's finding that there was competition and uh, there was a somewhat limited participation and there, and there, as I recall, was not a, a strong showing that the satellite in Niobrara and Goshen counties, I believe, uh, had had been a failure. That is not to say, I mean, it, it is, satellite is subject to geography, weather, it, it is not in all respects, the equivalent of a landline uh, because it is, it is susceptible to some, to some environmental and other interference potentially and, and latency. Um, the expectation has been that that, that will improve and I, I think that that it has to some degree, and uh, hopefully, it, it will it will uh, become a more a more successful application and a more uh, a more precisely equivalent service. But we realize that that it has not been. And okay. Good, Senator Scott. All right. Other questions for the Public Service Commission? Not seeing it right now, Mr. Petrie, you're off the hot seat, but don't go too far. Mr. Hendricks, come on down. And so as we're running a little behind schedule, I understand you're speaking for, are you speaking for the Telecom Association or for some consortium of, of telecommunications companies impacted by the sunset and 
Uh, we'll look forward to your comments. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, Jason Hendricks, Chief Government Relations Officer with uh, Range, or a rural uh, company in the state. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Wyoming Telecom Association, which is a group of rural carriers uh, in the state. Um, you should have a copy of the uh, summary of the Telecom Act and our proposals. Uh, hopefully you have an email and, and paper copy. Uh, what this document does is it's, uh, it's a section by section summary of the act, as well as an article by article uh, proposal that we have uh, with respect to the act. Uh, but before I get into this, just a real quick high level uh, history of regulation on how we got to this point. Um, prior to 1995, telecommunications was treated as a, as a utility um, with the traditional rate of return regulation, uh, similar to what you'd have with an electric company. In 1995 in Wyoming, uh, there was a telecommunications act that, uh, you know, the history of this act, um, which is, uh, had two primary goals, opening up the, the market for competition, recognizing that there are competitive technologies out there, a little bit different from some of the other utilities. It's not necessarily a natural monopoly. There is a way to have other technologies serve customers. So it was a, a opening up the market for competition, but then also establishing a universal service mechanism. Um, and so the, the goal with that is to keep rates affordable in the areas where there's not competition and to set up a mechanism for the funding of that so that carriers can charge an affordable rate. And so that's the universal service um, uh, mechanism that Mr. Petrie talked about with the surcharge associated with it. So if you happen to live in a uh, relatively large sized town in the, in the state, then uh, you've experienced the benefits of competition. Uh, you have multiple providers uh, that you can choose from, from different types of technologies. And with that, uh, there's a surcharge that you pay to help others who are less fortunate on the competition side uh, to have affordable rates um, uh, in their areas, mostly the rural areas. So uh, Wyoming kind of led the way with this in 1995 and then the Federal uh, uh, Communications Commission, the FCC had their act in 1996, which used a lot of the stuff from Wyoming. Um, and uh, but kind of took over in some some respects, but again, it's the same thing, opening up for competition, allowing for universal service. Uh, and then there were some delegations that we'll talk about in here uh, to the state on certain things with respect to competition. Um, so that's kind of the history of, of why the act is set up this way with competition in some areas, universal service and others. Uh, and so the question going in now uh, in, uh, with these, Telecom Act potentially sunsetting is, have we got to a point yet where there's competition everywhere? If there's competition everywhere, then there's no need for regulation because the market will take care of whatever needs to be taken care of. It'll keep uh, rates low. Uh, uh, everyone will be sure that there's good quality of service because there's competitive alternatives out there. And so uh, looking at the, at the act at this point, so I, I've, um, I started in the industry in, in 1996 um, shortly after the passage of the Telecom Act and helped implement that in the Illinois Commerce Commission uh, and been involved with um, Wyoming stuff since um, early 2000s. So I've been involved with the last three rewrites, which were in 2007, 2015, and 2019. So each phase along the way, I think that we've had competition expanding and the need for universal service uh, decreasing. And so now we're at this point, have we got to a point where there's competition everywhere and there's no need for universal service? Um, I don't think that we are quite there yet. Uh, if you've driven up, um, I, I drove up from Cheyenne uh, up route or highway 85, there's not cell phone coverage, most of that route. <laughs> uh, so if you, if, you, if you live in a decent sized town, you're gonna have obviously cell phone service. You're gonna have uh, cable uh, service. Um, so then you go outside of the big towns, the more rural areas, 
there is not cell phone coverage in a lot of places. There's not cable in a lot of places. So then that leaves um, satellite. And we just heard some of the potential issues with satellite. Um, and so those are, those are the alternatives. And, and really in a lot of places, the landline is the only choice. So at that point, should the commission have regulatory authority to keep prices affordable and to keep uh, service quality reasonable, to be in charge of things like outages and so forth. So looking at one end, you could say, uh, like, I don't think that we're at the point that you'd wanna let it sunset because I don't think there's perfect competition everywhere. On the other side, do you just let it roll the way it is? Uh, I don't necessarily think that's the case either because I do think that there are, uh, there is room for improvement. Um, so within the, uh, the telecom association, we actually have um, companies that maybe lean more one way or the other. Uh, but we've listened to consumer groups. Um, maybe some of those will end up being uh, speaking today. Um, we've looked at the competition that's out there. We've listened to other uh, telephone companies, broadband companies, what they're interested in, looking at what's coming on down the pike with uh, broadband grants that are out there. Um, and so what I think we came up with is something that's kind of in the middle that kind of uh, retains some regulation but allows more consideration for competition. So uh, with that, um, on, on this document that I provided in article one, uh, if I could characterize it in, in, a, in a big picture perspective, basically what this does, and this is a remnant of how this act was structured at the time, is telecommunications is broadly defined. And then regulation is narrowed down over time. So if you look within the different sections, telecommunications is basically everything. And then there are various provisions that say, but this is not regulated, this is not regulated, this isn't telecommunications and so forth. And then it gets down to what is essentially regulated, which is non-competitive essential local service. So your basically basic landline local phone service in areas where there's not competition, that's what's regulated. That's what has the price control later on in the act and the quality of service. So when we looked at this, um, we, we thought, well, maybe this can be rewritten so that it's not broadly defined and narrowed down. Maybe this can be rewritten so that it just simply says what the commission regulates. Non-competitive, essential telecommunication services. And so later on, where we talk about proposals, we talk about how to, again, look at that competition um, uh, scenario and then have in certain geographic areas, those things that are still left to regulation. So, so instead of starting broad and going down, start narrow, and then anything that's not regulated, the commission doesn't have control over. I do know that uh, some of the competitive carrier groups who, who might be speaking, uh, there are certain provisions in here that they wanna retain. You know, we'd, we'd certainly be willing to work with them and try to come up with the best way to do so. Uh, and so under our proposals, uh, uh, number one covers what I just talked about. Number two, you might have to do some definition modification. And then you might uh, need to uh, retain the broader definition for purposes of assessments, universal service contributions and other purposes. Um, so you'd end up with something that's narrowly regulated, which is primarily the landline terrestrial service. Um, and then we did put in here, and I'm going to talk about this in a little bit. Um, one way that you can get competition is through broadband. And so there are fixed wireless companies and other types of entities out there that provide broadband service different from the traditional fiber copper based method that we do. If there is a broadband connection, you can have voice over top of that. And so when I talked about some of these rural areas, there, there isn't broadband in a lot of these places either. So there's not the competitive option from, from broadband itself. The, there are a number of grants coming into the state um, that uh, seek to expand broadband throughout the state. Uh, I, I don't think there will be enough funding coming in to get broadband everywhere. Um, so in that scenario, one option is to have universal service expanded to include broadband for those areas after all the grants are distributed 
that don't have uh, broadband left, so that are still unserved. Um, so voice, uh, so voice service or broadband to the extent that, that there's no broadband in a ge geographic area. And then lastly, uh, there'd be a, a proposal to modif modify the sunset date to extend it out somewhere. Article two, um, generally what this uh, section of the act does is this, this gets you into the regulation uh, of what's regulated and how services are deemed to be competitive. So Mr. Hendricks, can I stop you real quick? How, I know I've seen a copy of this. I don't know how many other committee members have seen before today and actually read through it and thought about it. Um, Cause I, I know we could go through it for another 40 minutes, but I mean, it always, I think helps as a legislator to look at the legislation, see what the change is. And so my questions more for everyone are, you know, are you okay with pursuing this type of an avenue, um, extending the sunset date a couple of years? It's my understanding all of the telecommunications members who are members of the association are generally good where this is going. And that really just, there's a couple other companies who aren't in your association who I think are here who might wanna talk. Um, but if most of us or some of us have seen this bill draft, or do you? Uh, I, I think that uh, we, uh, we've talked with a number of members, maybe not every member, and I'd be happy to go through this a little faster if you want me to, or more high level, however, however you want to do it. Well, committee, it, it's, I guess generally my thought that we could go ahead and have this drafted into a bill. I think there's enough uncertainty at the federal level right now that completely scrapping the act next year might be premature, although another four years might also be too long. Um, and so at least having a bill draft in front of us with the changes might be the best avenue. But if anyone, I don't wanna rush the committee, I just need to know we're behind time. So if anybody wants to ask a specific question about any of these sections, I'm happy to have Mr. Hendricks go through them and why they are how they are. Um, but I also think we can do a lot in the off season between meetings where if this isn't a bill draft, you can certainly meet with your local telecom company and they can go through and kind of tell you what they're, um, they're thinking. And, you know, I think everybody has a little bit different perspective, but I do think the changes in this um, proposal have been somewhat vetted by the industry, by half of the committee at least, and we're probably ready to draft them in a bill. I think the, the outstanding question is on, can USF be broadband and how long we're going to set the repealer? We're going to Mr. extend Chairman. it. Senator Case, just what I wanted to hear from. What committee chip members saw this before and which didn't? Because uh, I, didn't, I didn't see this before. It was just my understanding several of you had talked to your local telecom people is what I was told. So I'm not sure who, nor do I need a show of hands, but- um, They must have missed me. Okay. I don't know if you've read through this quickly or if you want Mr. Hendricks to go through it in greater detail. No, um, maybe, I don't think uh, I do. Okay. Just trying to be efficient and get us through this. So, um, Mr. Hendricks, if there are some major, maybe the, the top three or four points in the next five minutes, you can hit and then we'll see if there's any questions. We'll go from there. Sure, I'll, I'll just hit the, the, the main points. I would say that for uh, Article 2, um, uh, Mr. Petrie talked about CPCN. Um, if the commission wants to retain that, we, we are fine with that. Um, on the pricing constraints, we have some suggestions in here on ways to maybe streamline some of the pricing filings that we have to do rather than the big traditional tariff kind of filings that we have to do. Uh, um, and then we're talking here about having the commission review some of the stuff once the, uh, the, the grant process has been completed with the federal broadband grants. Uh, Article three, uh, there's a, a registration requirement for inter exchange companies. These are long distance providers. Again, uh, whatever the commission feels is appropriate for that, we're supportive of. Um, Article four, I would say um, this really gets into the details on what is uh, regulated, what oversight the commission has over services. Um, Again, our proposal would be that that's limited to just those narrow sets of, of services that are regulated. Um, and then there's a, a, a certain things as far as what's delegated to the state. I, I would answer uh, Senator Case's question with 
I believe that the Telecommunications Act, specifically Section 251 and 252, uh, is, is what gives the commission, the Wyoming Commission, the authority to do certain things with interconnection. So it's a, it's it's specific in the in the federal act on what the state commission has to do. If the state regulation went away, I don't know what happens. I don't know what what authority the commission has to do certain things. But we we propose that 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 be retained in other federal de delegated authority and perhaps clarified and narrowed. Um, and then lastly, for universal service, uh, again, we talked about this being narrowed to certain geographic areas without competition for certain limited services, potentially expanded for broadband. And then if it is expanded for broadband, potentially expanded to other types of carriers rather than just your traditional uh, incumbent uh, types of providers. Um, it, you know, subject to uh, further review and analysis. For the broadband part, you know, we're, I think we're talking two, three years by the time that grant cycle comes out. And so what can be done between now and the next two or three years with respect to the existing um, universal service and uh, oversight. So I think that those are the, are the main things. I'd be happy to take any questions. I'd be happy to point you any, any other directions on certain things if you want, want me to follow up with you. Senator Scott has a question. Senator Scott, the floor is yours. Mr. Chairman, I didn't have a question. I've got a motion. You're ready for a motion. I don't think we've gone through all of the public comment of people who want to talk yet, but if you want to throw a motion out at this time, we can entertain one and then go back if you think it's appropriate at this time. Mr. Chairman, uh, up to you how you're going to run the meeting. I'm perfectly prepared to make a motion. Uh, I think there's three more people who want to testify before we make motions, but I will get to you first after uh, we close public comments, Senator Scott. That works. Any other questions for Mr. Hendricks at this time? Seeing none quite yet. And then committee, um, what Mr. Um, Jason passed out, I did see last week, and I, um, I think I was deficient in having LSO uh, included in packets and sent to you. So um, that is somewhat on me as a chairman that I... Um, didn't get it in final form and didn't get it through LSO to, to be on the in your package so you could look at this before the meeting over the weekend. So my apologies on that. It's a reflection on me, not on the Telecom Association. Other questions? Okay, seeing none. Thank you. Thank you. Um, other Telecom people wish to speak on the Telecom. Ms. Levin. Actually, Levine. Good to see you, Jody. Welcome back to Corporations. Another person with a long history on telecom sunsets and revisions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Jody Levin here on behalf of Charter Communications. And, and yes, nearing 20 years of working on telecom issues in Wyoming. Uh, I will make my comments extremely condensed. Uh, I agree, well, my client agrees with the, the premise that um, Mr. Hendricks and the rural carriers have laid out in that it's premature to sunset the act in its entirety, but the act does need review and modification. So at, at that kind of broad sense, uh, we are in agreement with the rural carriers. Uh, my client has, has seen the document, but only briefly. So they are, are working through it uh, to see where there could be areas of agreement, uh, where we might be able to align and where we will um, perhaps disagree. So at the, at the outset, there are a couple of provisions that I think uh, are incredibly important to my client. Um, this is in the terms of regulatory uh, certainty and uh, clarity. It's in incredibly important that um, elements of this act remain because it helps the competitive market. So to, to allow certain things to sunset and have a gray area on whether the commission does or does not have jurisdiction doesn't doesn't help with operational efficiency. So in, in that regard, sections 37, 15, 104, and 105 are very important. Uh, as Mr. Hendricks said, there are certainly elements of the market that are competitive and should be deregulated. That's under section 202, but not everything is competitive. Wholesale services are not competitive. So that's something that would be important to my clients to, to continue to have the commission exercise some oversight, 
particularly with respect to interconnection. Uh, to Senator Case's uh, question on um, section 404, this is the protection of consumers, section, subsections D, E, and F are the core provisions that really outline uh, the, the commission's delegation from, from the federal government that allow them to address disputes between carriers and also ensure that you can't have discrimination occur against other carriers. So from a competitive marketplace standpoint and for the protection of consumers, those elements remain important. And then from my client's perspective, the other piece that's in incredibly important is 3715.413. This is the limitation on political subdivisions exercising uh, exclusive agreements with carriers and essentially blocking out uh, other, other carriers from accessing the market. So uh, my client looks forward to working with the committee and, and I certainly look forward to working with my colleagues. I don't think this will be the telecom fights of years ago. Um, I was joking with Senator Case earlier that I do remember one committee meeting that went 14 hours on telecom alone. Uh, so we aren't, we aren't there anymore. Um, so I think we'll find much more commonality than disagreement. And I look forward to working with the committee. So slightly out of left field question, Ms. Levin, do you believe we need to have any type of working group with legislators or if we have the industry partners kind of work on what may be acceptable if we move this forward, either this or the general idea, do you think there's enough cooperative spirit out there this time for the changing market that you don't need a working group or task force with, with legislators, the industry could come together and present kind of a unified solution, even if it is for maybe a year or two more? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'm certainly glad to work with my, my industry colleagues in, in that regard. I don't know where all of the other carriers stand on this. Uh, we haven't had these kind of robust discussions yet. So I, I'd hate to opine as to where all of the carriers stand on that. Other questions, Ms. Levin? Not seeing Thank you, Mr. Much, Chairman. Judy. Other telecoms? Not yet. Any other public comment on the Telecom Act rewrite or sunset, depending on your preference? Not seeing any at this time. So Senator Scott, we'll close public comment and give you the floor for whatever motion you may want to start with. Mr. Chairman, um, I'll say at the outset, I have not seen the document. Uh, um, still haven't seen it. Uh, and so I don't really know what's in it, but we need something to work from. So uh, what I would move is that we ask the LSO to draft a uh, bill uh, based on the document that uh, Mr. Hendricks is, has prepared uh, with the following exception, I would ask we leave the uh, Universal Service Fund as it is right now and have Mr. Hendricks' proposal there uh, drafted as an amendment to it. Uh, I think that'll be a better procedure. I think that's gonna be controversial. Uh, and, and frankly, I don't care what they put in for a, a duration of the extension uh, I'll advise the committee. I want to take it a good deal longer. Uh, I think we're dealing with, with this act a little too frequently. And I want to put it off well into the future, maybe 10 years. Uh, but that's, that's a separate issue. And that's a very amenable thing. So that's my motion. Uh, and then I would hope the industry people could get together and look at it and see if they can develop a consensus on, on amendments that would be needed, but this would give us a document to work from. So, Mr. Is, Chairman. Thank you, is there a second? Second to motion, second by Boner. Um, and then also Senator Scott and committee members that did, um, this was emailed, it, was, it should be in your email at 11 a.m. this morning from Ms. Talbot. Um, so you can take it with you and committee members can review it more thoroughly. Um, so discussion on the motion from the committee to at least have a bill draft with the starting with this as a starting point. And then I would assume LSO would send it out to 
um, fairly quickly, hopefully. So for further discussion with industry and they could come with any agreeable amendments or amendments where they would like us to further delineate um, how the state should be or shouldn't be implementing. Any other discussion from the committee? Thoughts, directions? We'll take a break right after this. All right, not seeing any discussion from committee member. All in favor of Senator Scott's motion, say aye. Aye. All opposed, say no. No. Okay, the ayes have it. So LSO, just making sure on the same page, we'll start with the Telecom Association's proposal. And if this is something we could work a little quicker on and get out either internally or on the website so the industry can start working on um, digesting. And I'm sure Mr. Hendricks will work with um, his partners on both in the phone and the uh, other telecom world to find agreeable languages on, on what's agreeable and what um, we can decide as a committee we need to move forward on. And I think we'll have a longer discussion on the sunset, four years, two years, one year, um, I think there's various views from the committee on that. Anything else on telecom committee? Members of the public, anybody else have anything on telecom they'd like this committee to hear about? Okay. Uh, we are now at uh, the point we can go to lunch. Um, let's take a five minute break and then we'll come back and talk pharmacy benefit managers.
mediums. And that regulation can generally be categorized into 12 different areas uh, that are listed in the bullet points. Wyoming regulates PBMs in four of those 12 areas. If you'd like to see a description of those 12 different regulation areas, you can turn to Appendix A. Could, do you know briefly which four of those bullet points is that later in the presentation, or I don't see it listed on which four are the ones that we currently have? I do, and it, um, it will talk about it on the next page, but I can tell you Wyoming regulates uh, cost disclosure, gag, we have a cost disclosure gag clause. Uh, we regulate PBM maximum allowable reimbursement lists. We regulate the pharmacy auditing and appeals process, and we require PBM licensure by the Department of Insurance. So if you turn to page four of the issue brief, it gives you a little bit of history about Wyoming regulation of PBMs. So in 2016, this committee sponsored House Bill 35, uh, which was passed, the Pharmacy Benefit Manager Regulation Act. And the original act uh, just addressed three areas of PBM regulation. It required PBM licensure, um, had requirements as far as PBM maximum allowable cost lists and how PBMs audit pharmacies. Then in 2019, um, the legislature passed House Bill 63, which amended the, the initial act and added a fourth area of regulation to do with cost disclosures and gag clauses. Uh, the rest of page four just talks in more detail about how the current uh, statute regulates PBMs in those four different areas, including licensure requirements um, that the Department of Insurance has for PBMs. And then if you turn to page six, it talks about the Labor Committee's proposed um, Senate File 36 that was considered by the legislature uh, this past session. And Senate File 36 proposed to strengthen provisions regarding PBM licensure, maximum allowable cost lists, and pharmacy auditing. And then it also proposed to add five new areas of regulation to do with network adequ adequacy, pharmacy reimbursements or clawbacks, regulatory agency enforcement, so that would be enforcement by the Department of Insurance, uh, reporting transparency requirements for PBMs, and spread pricing. And so the uh, pages six and seven go into detail on what uh, Senate File 36 proposed to do in each of those areas. If you would like to see a comparison of the current PBM Act and then the changes proposed by Senate File 36, you can look at Appendix C to the issue brief. And then the last page of the issue brief, page eight, um, also summarizes the fiscal impacts and the non-administrative impacts um, of that of Senate File 36. So that is my quick run through. And if anyone has questions, please let me know. Okay. Any questions, Ms. Shipman from LSO? Yep, go ahead, Representative McGuire. Uh, thank you, Ms. Chairman. And I should have looked this up before your fine presentation. Is there a penalty provision that's associated with this? Insofar as is it a misdemeanor? If, if there's a violation, is it a misdemeanor felony? What degree? And if so, where would you find that? Thank you. Mr. Shippen, if you know. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Representative McGuire, my understanding is under the current um, PBM uh, Regulation Act that the Department of Insurance only oversees PBM licensure but does not have any additional enforcement authority. Um, so I believe if PBMs don't adhere to some of the requirements in this act, I don't. Um, I, I think pharmacies would have to uh, bring a complaint to the department, but I, I guess I would have to defer to the department to talk about what their current authority is regarding those complaints. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, and maybe someone in the audience knows, uh, 
in terms of this gag clause, I thought that was lifted recently. Ms. Shippen, if you know. Uh -huh. Chairman Zwanitzer and Representative Duncan, I'm not aware that it was lifted, but if someone in the audience knows about that, okay. Sure. You would answer uh, the question on gag order lifting. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, Representative Duncan, yes, that uh, gag order was lifted nationally. And because you're at a new committee, I just need you to introduce oh, yourself. Excuse me. I'm Melinda Carroll. I'm here representing, representing the Wyoming Pharmacy Association. Um, so I do have knowledge in this area. Um, so yes, uh, Chairman Zwanitzer, Representative Duncan, it was lifted nationally by the Trump administration. Um, that went through in 2019 as well, just prior to our gag clause um, legislation going through. Uh, the defense of having ours go through in any ways was in case something happened federally where that didn't actually occur. But yes, it has been lifted federally. Sure. Other questions, Ms. Shippen? Not seeing any. Let me double check online. Nope. I think Senator Scott's internet went out again for the afternoon. Thank you very much, Mr. Shippen. All right, committee. I know the Commissioner of Insurance is here. Um, certainly would welcome him if he has any thoughts on um, how he would like to spend another interim. Um, but again, I would kind of committee, there have been some conversations the last week that, and where I think we're going is a working group, probably of four legislators from this committee. Um, working with all the interested parties and really bringing something back, um, hopefully by our August meeting. But I guess, so what I'm maybe most interested in commissioner are the areas you believe um, Wyoming could look at um, perhaps the same 12 that we have allowability over um, or anything that you thought maybe last year's bill was, didn't cover extensively or overcovered or any thoughts you have on where you think we should be going um, for the benefit of the state. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, committee members, Jeff Root, the uh, insurance commissioner, um, we're neutral during the interim and we'll be neutral again in this interim uh, talking about any bills that come forward. I'm not, I don't think, in a position to say what I think we want to see. I've talked to all the different commissioners who have all of these different provisions. Um, some work better than others a lot. I, I mean, I, I think I can come back and I can check and tell you some lead to litigation just flat out the parties are ready uh, to, they, you know, they have lawyers on hand and they're willing to, to litigate any action that you take. Um, I will make one quick point. Since we do register PBMs, we do have authority over them. We can pull their registration and then they can't work in Wyoming. Dr draconian and drastic, I agree, but there is that authority. Uh, plus we have the ability to do certain uh, fines uh, with, with built in there's they're certainly entitled to a hearing and whatnot. There's due process there, but we do have some authority over them. Um, the states that have all 12 of these provisions, it is a mammoth lift for those insurance departments. I will just leave it with that. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to see where we go and what direction and how many of those we pick, and then I can give you a better uh, idea of workload and what it will take for us to do it. But we, we were involved in 2016. Uh, if we can assist and help again, we'll do it uh, as best as we can. So. It's fair to say that any of these we start expanding in statute will require more work from your department and potentially more employees or more funding to investigate, depending which way we go, there is a cost to all this that will probably Absolutely. be borne by your department. Absolutely, Mr. Chairman, there's different ways of doing it. I mean, whether it's upfront uh, filing fees, whether it's giving us the ability to assess more, whether it's charging PBMs for investigations and, and hiring vendors to do all of that. There's a lot of options available depending upon which direction the committee wishes to go. Questions for the insurance commissioner, Representative McGuire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. If this does move forward, uh, would one of your considerations please be that uh, we, if there's going to be a penalty provision, that it be simplified and where to find it typically at the end of the statutory section or something like that, and also give us recommendations. So again, to me, it's unfair for a company to come to Wyoming to try and operate if they don't know what the rule book is. 
So it should be, rather than having to tease it out, it should be right there. So if you could help us. Mr. Chairman, Representative McGuire, that's a good point because the, what we're, when, when, when the uh, specific statute is silent, we go to the very beginning of the statute, which says for violations of this, you, the following can occur. It, it does make complete sense to spell it out in this section so everybody knows it go, uh, going into it. Okay. Other questions for the Commissioner of Insurance, Trip of LeBeau. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I just want to reiterate being in labor and then now in corporations and listening to this bill. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong, I know you're neutral, but you have expertise. And you just now stated that some work better than others. And so if you could just help the committee with the better working ones. <laughs> Providing that information would be, would be great so we can make a better informed decision when it comes down to it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Uh, further questions from the insurance commissioner? Not seeing any. Um, a couple other people signed up to testify of uh, state agencies. So I know Director Cooley from Workforce Services and then Mr. Uh, Martinow for the state pharmacist, but welcome Director Cooley. Not often we get you to corporations. Um, but thanks for being with us. And any thoughts you have on PBMs, we'd certainly like to hear. Thank you, um, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Robin Cooley, a Director of the Wyoming Department of Workforce Services. Could I also ask that Jody Bauer, who was our Deputy Administrator for Claims, be led into the room? Uh, but uh, um, I'll, I'll keep going here. Um, I'm here today with uh, Jody Bowers. Uh, with our Deputy Administrator for Claims in our Workers' Compensation Division, just to provide you some general information about the potential impact of, um, of the Senate File 36 from the 2022 budget session on our Workers' Compensation Division. Uh, workers' Compensation does utilize the Pharmacy Benefit Manager, uh, and there would be impacts with that uh, current legislation, the way it is drafted. Uh, currently, we have a contract with a vendor uh, called Corvell Healthcare Corporation. They act as our pharmacy benefit manager. Um, Senate File th uh, 36, if it were enacted, um, we would need to amend our current contract with them to comply with some of the auditing and reporting requirements that are in the current legis proposed legislation. Um, more importantly, we, and we just wanted to provide you with information uh, and the impact to businesses in the state, um, our vendor has reviewed the legislation and, and estimates that the additional duties required from the legislation would cost an estimated $500,000 to the uh, fund annually. Uh, so we just wanted to provide that information to you, Mr. Chairman. And, and with that, Ms. Bowers and I are happy to answer any questions the com committee may have. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, let me first check, Ms. Bauer, anything else to add that the director didn't mention? Okay, let Mr. me see if there's any questions from the committee. Oh, no. Oop, did somebody else online want to talk? Any questions committee for workforce services? Or Ms. Bauer, if you did have anything else to add, sorry, jump right in right now. Mr. Chairman, no, thank you. No, thank you. Okay, my apologies. I think the internet is just a little slow, so there's a time delay. Um, but certainly appreciate you both being here and hanging out with us for the day. And I'm sure we will involve you as we move forward with the PBM discussion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, with that, Mr. Thank you, Director. Uh, Matt, I know as the state, pharma uh, state pharmacist, you weren't intimately involved last year in the PBM bill. And as we were discussing all of this, we kind of asked why not. Um, and so just while we invited you, if you have any thoughts you'd like to share on uh, what your colleagues in other states are doing or what you believe the Board of Pharmacy, um, if there's a role for your agency to play in this, I'd certainly give you the floor and um, invite any testimony you want to give. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Uh, so yeah, my name's Matt Martineau. I'm the Executive Director for the Wyoming State Board of Pharmacy. Uh, I was just uh, wanting to be available for the members of the committee to answer any questions that they may have. Uh, the Board of Pharmacy has a very limited role. Um, we have regulatory authority over the pharmacies, 
and uh, the the issue at hand is something that goes between the pharmacies and and PBMs and payers, and and the board of pharmacy has no regulatory authority over over the payers. Um, uh, so we would we would be neutral uh, on the bill in that sense that we don't have a horse in the race, as they say. But we're available for the committee to be a resource to answer any questions that uh, that the committee may have. Um, I believe in some states uh, they've pursued some changes to where they've brought some of the PBMs under the under the Board of Pharmacy as far as giving the those boards uh, that regulatory authority. And then there's other states that have not. They've kept it within their uh, insurance commission or, or a similar body. Um, again, just want to be here more as a as a resource for the committee and try to answer any questions that you may have and, and do do what we can for you guys here. Okay. Do you have any complaints that go up to the Board of Pharmacy you've heard regarding PBMs? Does it just go to the Department of Insurance and kind of skipped you historically? We hear about concerns related to uh, things that happen in pharmacies because of, of the things that are driven by PBMs. Uh, there ends up being, and nationally, there's a lot of concern about uh, workplace uh, safety issues and workload issues for pharmacists and the patient safety outcomes that are associated with it, because a lot of pharmacies end up getting put under pretty tremendous strain to to keep staffing at a level where they can themselves maintain their profits. And so uh, pharmacy staff are continually being asked to do more and more and more with fewer and fewer and fewer people. Um, so nationally, there there is some concerns about uh, patient safety as a result of of some of these uh, these practices. Okay. Any questions uh, for the Board of Pharmacy? We'll have them. Okay, not seeing it right now. Thank you though for being here, Matt. Over that committee. Yep. Uh, come on forward, sir. Do you have anything on PBMs you want to discuss? before we start making some motions. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, my name is Ralph Hayes. I'm the manager of the Employees and Officials Group Insurance Program. Came up here basically to provide you some basic information and be available to answer any questions. Now, last year, I was not part of the working group. In fact, I didn't find out about it until October, but I would uh, appreciate an opportunity to be part of it because I do bring some expertise into it. One of the things you have to understand is there's a reason for PPMs to be in business to begin with. And part of it is the drug costs associated. Uh, when you look at a RAND research report, uh, 2021 of drug pr price comparison, the average US prices for drugs as a whole is 256% higher than 32 other countries. And if you get it down to the name brand drugs, it's 344% of what these other countries have paid. So basically, your pharmacy benefit managers are really working uh, against the pharmaceutical companies who are setting the prices, trying to keep the costs under control for insurers and self-funded employers like us. Now, <clears throat> if you want to learn a little bit more about the pharmacy landscape, the Chew, uh, Pew Charitable Trust has a report out. It was March of 2019, which talks about the prescription drug landscape explored. Great information in here. One of those things that came out of that one in uh, looking at the, uh, let's see, now I've lost it, excuse me. As far as the rebates were concerned, 78% of manufacturer rebates were uh, passed to health plans in 2012. And by 2016, that had jumped to 91%. So there's a lot of talk about what happens with rebates in this discussion, and basically it's being passed to insurers and self-funded employers like us. Now we are a self-funded insurer. We have a direct contract, an open contract. We get 100% of the rebates. So that does have a direct bottom line impact on our rates. In fact, when we went to our RFP process last year, we chose a new PBM, and the additional savings came close to $12 million. We did a rate 
decrease of 6% last year, mostly because of that change in pharmacy benefit managers and that increase in rebates. So a lot of the potential pieces of legislation have a direct impact upon us, which we can help identify. So pass that, I stand for any questions. Questions, Mr. Hayes? Not seeing any, thanks for coming up. All right, committee. I know I'm happy to entertain any other public comment, but I think uh, most of the other people in the room who came up have talked behind the scenes. And I think we're all on the same page that if there's a motion from the floor that a task force developed and we spend some significant time in a smaller level working group that everybody has noticed and can attend and, and really work out the fine details, um, it's more productive use of our time. So with that, Representative Duncan, you look like you'd like to make a motion. So I'll start with you. I would like to move a task force be created by, um, by the committee uh, made up of some of the stakeholders to come up with a potential draft. And then do we, oh, let me see if there's a second. Second by LeBeau. Um, the question I guess before us then committee is, do we wanna take on certain areas um, and kind of put some sideboards on this committee? Do we trust um, that the working group or the, let me start with LSO. Do I wanna, do we in this motion wanna call it a task force or a select committee? Um, as I need to pitch the idea for management council, probably there's not funding in our budget. Um, what's the best way to title it there, Mr. Anderson? So Mr. Chairman, um, generally uh, working groups, a little more flexible, um, but the members uh, don't get salary for those. If you want a subcommittee, uh, then you can get uh, salary. There are some more restrictions on that that I'll have to uh, look up a little bit, but uh, those are essentially your two options, a working group or a, a subcommittee. Okay, so then the question on the, the floor is really, do we wanna kind of delineate maybe some of those 12 areas? Do we wanna go through what was covered in the bill last year? I mean, the things I keep hearing about are the you know enforcement or regulatory a portion, the pharmacy reimbursement or what pharmacies, especially independent pharmacies can do to level the playing field, shall we say. Um, and then some issues on network adequacy. And then if there's anything else we need to do and regarding the gag clauses, which I think are completed, but there may be some residual things in state statute we need to cover. Those are the issues I've heard about. Uh, Representative Duncan. Mr. Chairman, maybe perhaps the once we create this um, working group that maybe we do a quick meeting outside of us, kind of get an idea of where we can get together and then send an email maybe back to the committee, to the rest of the committee of where we're in LSO of where we kind of got some common ground and go from there. That seems agreeable to me, committee, is there other thoughts of things you'd like to add in this? I mean, I think we have a pretty good list, especially the members of the audience who are here, you've all signed in, so we know who you are and um, we'll certainly keep you apprised. I think there's probably room for some larger working group meetings and some smaller offsets on specific statutes uh, that we, you know, the legislators probably could help direct and we'd probably ask for some help from our state agencies, like the director of insurance to, you know, keep the ball moving and not go outside of the lines. So. Uh, with that, I guess, if the motion, do we want to establish committee members? Maybe after the motion, that way I'll get you to vote for it um, before we put people on it. But I'd certainly look for volunteers if anybody immediately wants to serve. Um, I know Representative Duncan is excited, and I'm sure I would be happy to, as it's an issue, um, but we probably would like some Senate colleagues. And I'm certainly happy to nominate uh, my good co-chairman uh, while he stepped out of the room. Um, but if there's another Senator Case or boner. Um, Senator Scott is um, also not here. Makes it easy, huh? Um, ooh, being asked. How about with that? We will work on trying to find two House members and two Senate members, and I'll work with my co chairman on. I know it's campaign season, and some of us have more difficult summers ahead than others on, on requirements on who can really devote the necessary work to this. Right? So excited. All right, with that, is there any 
if that's the direction the committee takes, I don't want to deny public comment to other people who I know drove a long ways for this. But if that seems agreeable to everyone, um, I'm getting head nods. Um, we will certainly have multiple meetings throughout the interim and try to see what headway we can make. If there's progress by our August meeting, we'll bring it back. And if not, we'll have significant time on our um, October, November meeting to really hammer out um, some bills if that works for everybody. All right, with that, let me have a motion or a vote on the motion to have a, let's say select committee um, or subcommittee for the motion. And then the co-chairs of that subcommittee can talk to management council and further hammer out what that might look like. So. We have not picked senators yet at this time. Co-chairman Driscoll and I will try to find two of you to jump aboard. And they don't necessarily have to be legislators currently on the committee. As you know, um, the bills will be presented in the 2023 session. Some of us may not be here, um, other, and it may not even go to this committee. So Why I, is Senator Pace not making eye contact? I think we would ask uh, maybe management council, my co-chairman, if there are two senators um, or maybe even three, right? Who have an interest. I know several health committee, labor health senators worked on this. They may want back on as well to move the ball down the field. So um, I'll pledge to you that we will find the right legislators who are excited and will put in the effort to have the time this year. And our industry partners who've driven a long way for us to say, we're gonna have more meetings. They're very excited right now. All right, with that, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Opposed aye. say no. Okay, so that motion's passed. Um, Josh, I assume that means I need to draft a memo to management council along with my co-chairman to ask for such subcommittee uh, of corporations um, and probably some financing and a number of meetings that, you know, co-chairman Driscoll and I can work with you on detailing how that message looks. And I will look forward to seeing many of you in the audience this summer and this fall as we continue to work on these issues. Um, Anything else now that that motion, is there any other motions in regards to PBMs or anything that um, before we jump into insurance or the people who are here would like to discuss or add on? Seeing none. All right, with that, we'll move on to the next agenda item, which is insurance. Um, welcome back, Commissioner Rude. I would say thank you all for joining us, but there seems to be a very large rainstorm outside, so I don't think any of you are going anywhere. With that, please welcome the Department of Insurance up. And Commissioner Root, the floor is yours. Uh, Mr. Chairman, committee members, again, it's uh, Jeff Root, the insurance commissioner. Uh, with me also, we brought the whole band. We've got uh, def our new deputy, Tan Howard, our Brian Stevens, our licensing supervisor, <coughs> and Bryce Hamilton, our senior policy analyst for health. Unfortunately, Ms. Johnson retired after 31 years, and it's a tragic loss. And I am not overestimating that in any way. We, we, we miss her. I thought we'd have one more meeting with her, but I will express my... Did she have a going away party? We weren't invited, huh? We went yeah. with her list. Okay. Well, so. welcome to the uh, your new role and uh, big shoes to fill, but we're confident you'll jump right in. So go ahead, Mr. Rich. All right, Mr. Chairman, uh, we have a few code revisions. The first one is the simplest one, which I will handle, of course, because it's the simplest. It is the one page that you all have involving a requirement for medical malpractice insurers to do an annual report to our office. It's very detailed. This was in response to a medical malpractice problem we had back in 2005, 2006. We didn't have any carriers. And so we wanted, so this report is done and it's attached to our annual report that goes to the governor. I still want to do the report. I just want to make the format here at our discretion. I don't want to actually have to ask the insurers for this information because quite frankly, they get it wrong and we spend a lot of information, a lot of time truing it up. Uh, there's a national database, practitioners database out there. We can get the exact, we can get the same information and it's much simpler to use. Um, and so I would just, you know, with the one page, we'd like it at our discretion. If we should ever need to go back and request it, we'll give them six months notice. And so I'm happy to answer questions on that little one portion of our re revisions. Any questions on that provision committee? Seems good to me so far. All right, not seeing any questions, keep going. All right, uh, the second area of code revisions deals with our uh, modernization of the anti-rebating statutes. I will turn that over to Brian Stevens and Tana Howard to brief you. 
And Commissioner, I'm just making sure on the same page, you want one bill with all the revisions and would be your preference, or if you, I guess I wanna know if you see a need that these are controversial enough, we need separate revision bills, or if you believe we can put them in one piece of legislation? The, this the issue with the malpractice reporting is, I would not think controversial at all. Uh, I would think we could do this in one bill, but I have seen YDOT have bills pulled apart last session quite considerably. So I guess I will leave it up to your judgment and LSO's thoughts on this. All right, we'll see how it goes here and we'll wait for a motion on if we can make it in one bill or if we need multiple. Um, with that, Mr. Stevens, who's welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So what we are working on here is modernizing our rebating statutes. Uh, for those of you that are unfamiliar, rebating in terms of insurance are any gifts or favors that an agent would give or a company would give in exchange for buying a policy or any sharing of commissions or refunds of commissions by an agent uh, to any of their clientele. The way the law currently reads, any gift that any agent would give for any reason would be considered a rebate. For instance, if Representative Buzwanitzer were my client, he and I could not go out for a cup of coffee while I discuss his policy. That is currently against the law. What we are trying to do here is be more business friendly in the state and allow uh, a certain dollar amount to go towards you know, what would currently be considered a rebate. For instance, this last year I had a company call and ask, hey, we have 10 large clients, we would like to send them fruit baskets, they're valued at about 40 bucks, can we do that? I had to tell them no. I don't think that's unreasonable and we would like to allow for that. What we've done here is we've taken the NAIC model on rebating and added it to our current statutes. While we were doing that, uh, we decided to condense the life and health rebating statutes and the property and casualty rebating statutes all into one to make it consistent across all lines. Uh, title does have its own restrictions, but so that wouldn't be included here, but all other major lines would have the same rules rather than having one set of rules for one type of insurance and another set of rules for another type. So with all that in mind, with the document we've given you going through it line by line, uh, if we get onto the first page, uh, line 17, the having like insuring risk or risk characteristics, that is where we condensed it in from what is currently 2613.112C. Uh, going down to B, that came from 2613.110B. And at the bottom of page one there uh, is model language on offering or providing insurance as an inducement to the purchase of another policy, so on and so forth. There was an omission here that I accidentally made. Uh, after D on, uh, on line 30, uh, we did mean to put in section B of what is currently 2613.109. We would like to strike that. And I would be happy to read that statute for the, for the committee if you would like me to. Sure, and we don't necessarily have page numbers. We have statutory citations on our stuff. So, um, but go ahead, go ahead and read that please. Okay. So uh, this, the statute that we're, that we're looking to erase, 2613.109B, currently reads, if a disability insurance contract provides for payment or reimbursement for services which may be legally performed by a person licensed in the state for the practice of dentistry, payment or reimbursement shall not be denied or refused solely for the reason that the services are rendered by a person licensed to practice dentistry. We're looking to strike that because dentistry is covered under the disability statutes and it's redundant to have it in there twice. If you can still hear me, I'd be happy to keep going. Committee, are you? So for the people listening at home, there is a massive rainstorm that's making it rather difficult to hear, but I think we'll proceed if that's okay, committee. Just speak loud. All right. So moving on to page two, uh, the strike throughs and add-ins that we've done on uh, section two and three, those are to carry it across all types of insurance, both property and casualty and life and health. Uh, on Romanet A under section, under Romanet three, the discount credit or reduction of premiums payable on the contract, they came in from 2613.112B. Uh, everything on the third page, starting at Romanet B and going down through Romanet uh, 
five as a lowercase b, that is all condensed in from what is currently 2613111A. This is all language that deals specifically with life and health insurance and the different types of, of uh, policy provisions we have within those policies. When we get down to Romanet 6 under Romanet B towards the bottom of page three, any insurer from allowing or returning to its participating policyholders, that came from 2613.112.D2. The next section is 2613.112.D1. On the next page, Romanet 8 uh, starts with the seller, selling or offering for sale. That is currently 2613.111.B. And then we get to Romanet 9. Uh, from here on, this is model language. So what we are accomplishing with Romanet 9, this is allowing value added products from property and casualty or life and health insurers to be given to clients. For example, uh, there are property and casualty insurers that would offer to give their clients a fire extinguisher as part of their uh, home insurance policy that would mitigate fire damage. Currently, that's not allowed. Uh, we want to be able to allow them to do that. There are other things they could do, like uh, giving a device that will allow you to plug into your electrical outlet to see if you have a risk of an electrical fire. What these statutes are doing is saying you are the insurer is allowed to give a gift or a value-added product as part of the policy, as long as it is helping to mitigate the risk. If they mitigate the risk, it helps keep premiums lower. We feel this is a good thing. Uh, on the next page at Romanet 8, uh, capital Roman numerals, incenting behavioral changes, that goes on the health insurance side of things to also mitigate risk. If people are healthier, there are less claims. Uh, going on through this, there are a lot of uh, rules that the insurer must follow. For instance, they can't be discriminatory. They have to offer it to everybody. Uh, they can't pass those costs on uh, through other means. And, and that's all model language? What's that? That's all model language. This is all model language, 100%. Uh, moving on to Romanet C on what would be page six. This is model language, which is uh, discussing what agents or producers may do. So this is where they can give non-cash gifts, items, or services uh, to their clients. We are capping the value at $100. The model language is $250. Within our internal discussions, we feel that $100 is reasonable on personal lines policies. For instance, to go out for a cup of coffee or uh, give your client a card for their birthday or anything along those lines, $100 we feel is a reasonable cap. When we get to Romanet 2, we're dealing specifically with commercial policies. Because commercial policies are bigger and typically involve more people, we are capping that at 5% of the written or quoted premium. Uh, that is straight from model language. We are not dead set on any of these uh, amounts. This is just what we decided to start with and sounded reasonable within the department. And so when we say model language, is it NAIC model language on how other states do the same thing? Yes, it is NAIC model language. Uh, it is recently released model language. There are other states that have similar statutes. Uh, the language we're using was just released in 2021, uh, but our statutes haven't been updated since 1971, and we felt this was an opportune time to do so. Uh, one of the other things this allows, if we go to Romanet 3 there, it allows conducting raffles or drawings. Uh, Right now, if an insurer was to say, if you come into my office and get a quote, you'll be entered into a raffle for a $50 Barnes & Noble gift card. That is currently against the law. Uh, we do have some problems with this, but because they're not required to buy a policy, they're only required to come in and give the, give the agent a shot. Uh, we are allowing a raffle for up to $100. These raffles also have to follow the state gaming commission law, so they cannot be discriminatory in the least bits. Uh, Romanet D still comes from model language. It says that they need to keep records that uh, shall be furnished to us upon request. That way, if we do get complaints, they can show us receipts and tell us exactly what they were doing and why they were doing it. Uh, Romanet E is 
also model language saying we, if we need to, we can adopt regulations. Romanet F specifically says what insurance includes as far as surety ship and annuities and policies, including bonds. Those are currently listed in 2613.112E. And then when we get to the last section, uh, which is part of 2692.12, we are simply amending the statutory references to include 2613.109 and 2613.110. And as I said at the beginning, we would be completely repealing 111 and 112, but those are folded into what we have put into this bill. All right, questions committee. I guess I, I have maybe a general question so we can delay this to a subsequent meeting and have a more final vote. But I guess I'm wondering if you believe this is in pretty final form, if you want the motion to just send it to the 2023 session, or if you think you want another review, further comment with NAIC, with anyone else, do you, no. do you want us to move it to a different meeting or do you think it's in final form to just push it today? Mr. Chairman, uh, given that it's, you know, following the model law and, and, and we put in a lot of effort, I think if y'all are comfortable, we can deal with it now and vote on it. Like I said, I don't think either of these are very controversial, but I hate to waste any more of your time that you could spend on PBMs in the future. So Mr. Chairman? Senator Case, go ahead. Well, Mr. Chairman, um, since we lost Senator Scott, he's always very thorough on these. And uh, I, I'm not sure I see the harm in having LSO put it in an LSO form, and then we take a look at it. We make sure Senator Scott's got it. We make sure the public has a chance to look at it. I agree, it's gonna be real easy. It won't take up much time next time, but I think it would be, we gotta remember some people probably couldn't access this meeting uh, for various reasons. So it might be wise to carry it over with an LSO draft. Okay, when the proper time comes for motion, um, whoever makes the motion, keep that in mind. Other questions? No, we're not at a motion yet. Any other questions for the insurance department? On this one. Do you, um, do you have another bill after this you wanna? Um, Mr. Just... Chairman, we do not. Okay, so now would be an opportune time. Are there any public comment on this specific bill? You do have public comment, so you don't have public comment. You do. So I'm going to nicely ask at least half of you to move from the table. Congrats on your first corporations meeting, even though there was a rainstorm and we didn't call on you for anything. With that, Walter and Ms. Wilkinson. Hopefully that mic is also on. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Catherine Wilkinson on behalf of American Property Casualty Insurance Association, I'm here to just stand in support of the rebate bill. It is based on the NAIC model language. We would like to see the official draft, but have a lot of faith in the, the commissioner and um, his staff with the way that was drafted. So we would like to stand in support of that. Thank you. Thank you, questions? And that was both, you just testified for two different entities. Remind me one more time. Just one entity on this one, American Property and Casualty Insurance Association, but I do have a public comment regarding insurance. If, at the appropriate at time the appropriate after time. this motion. Yes. Okay. Is there other further public comment on this bill before a motion's made? Not seeing any, we'll close public comment on the piece of legislation and look for a motion. Representative Burt. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I make a motion that we send the language that we have to LSO for an LSO draft to review for next meeting. Is there a second? Seconded by LeBeau. Any discussion? All in favor of that motion say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. That motion is passed. All right. Commissioner, anything else on in insurance from your end? I know there's going to be a couple other things coming up, but. I, uh, nothing from my end, but I'll sit here in case a okay. question should. Right. All right. So on other insurance things uh, before us, if anyone else has stuff they'd like to talk about, welcome, Ms. Wilkinson. The floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I am here today also um, on behalf of the United uh, U.S. Travel Insurance Association. Uh, Mr. Michael Byrne is on Zoom, but I'm here as a backup in case the technology did not work. Um, wanted to see if the committee may be interested in uh, considering some legislation uh, regarding the insurance code revision topic from Management Council 
on uh, travel insurance regulatory framework to fit into the existing limited lines uh, section within our statute. And I believe Mr. Byrne is on Zoom and happy to answer any questions to my very limited ability uh, should the committee have some. Okay, with that, uh, we do have Mr. Byrne um, visiting, joining us, the floor is yours. I'm not sure the video works, but I think we can hear you, go ahead. Not quite yet. Hi, this is, this is Michael Byrne. Can you, hopefully you can all hear me. Took a few seconds yep. to get lit in the room and thank you again. My name is Michael Byrne and uh, I represent the United States Travel Insurance Association, uh, otherwise known as the USTIA. The USTIA's members include insurance carriers, third-party administrators, insurance agencies, and other related businesses in the travel insurance uh, industry. Uh, thank you for your time today. Uh, really appreciate uh, the consideration. We um, respectfully uh, seek introduction of travel insurance legislation in Wyoming. Um, the legislation we specifically propose is the NAIC Travel Insurance Model Act, which is substantially the same as an earlier model act adopted by the National Council of Insurance Legislators or NCOIL. The NAIC model has been enacted in 28 uh, other states so far, including most recently in Iowa, Nebraska, South Dakota, and Utah. Um, all of the 28 states have substantially adhered to the Model Act language, such that the regulatory uh, framework for travel insurance sales is substantially uniform across those 28 states. Uh, we're hoping to, to expand that across the country. Uh, the legislation, if enacted, will provide certainty for the industry, uh, regulators, and consumers in the regulatory framework for travel insurance sales. Um, we've been uh, fortunate uh, to have had um, uh, some dialogue already with um, the insurance department, including uh, Mr. Stevens and Ms. Howard, who were, were before you a few minutes ago. We visited uh, Cheyenne um, at the end of May and look forward to uh, continuing the dialogue with the insurance department. I know they have some questions on, on the model language and uh, how it might fit into the existing statutes in Wyoming, which, which already address um, what's called specialty lines insurance, which already includes travel insurance, uh, but we're looking to uh, build on that and adopt the NAIC model language um, specific, specifically for travel insurance has been updated by the NAIC and, and obviously happy to answer any questions and look forward to working with you all um, as well as the um, insurance department staff going forward. Okay, questions for Mr. Byrne. From what I understand, um, they're asking us to have a bill draft uh, that's a model legislation in other states for travel insurance that was passed by NAIC and NCOIL. Uh, any questions on for him? Not seeing you right now, Mr. Byrne, but don't go too far. Um, Commissioner, uh, floor is yours for thoughts on uh, this model act. I assume you're aware of it and Met with your staff? Mr. Chairman, yeah, uh, we started working with industry in January on, on the Model Act. And the Model Act is not as clean as many Model Acts. It's not written very well as many Model Acts are. And the states that have adopted it have taken issue with certain parts of it. And we have some serious concerns that we're trying to work through now. I don't think it's ready for prime time. Uh, if you wanted to take it up, We'll go that route and we'll try to express our concerns with you. I would respectfully ask that we give an opportunity to continue to work with them to give you something that we all could agree on and be happy with. Because right now we are not close to it. And so let me make, I better make sure for my understanding, is there a separate NCOIL Model Act and an NAIC Model Act? And when, so when we're saying the Model Act, I assume Mr. Byrne is using the NAIC. Is that the, we're on the same Model Act? Let me start there. Um, Commissioner Reed. I guess I, Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I'm not sure where the 28 states, all 28 states come from because I don't think it's the NAIC Model Act. I could be wrong. That's why I have smart people that work for me who know when to come up to the table. So I will pass this to Ms. Howard. Deputy Commissioner, go ahead. Tana Howard, Deputy Commissioner of Insurance. Mr. Chairman, um, there are two models, a travel 
uh, insurance model acts, they're pretty much identical for NCOIL and NAIC. Um, the one that we've been working with the travel industry on recently um, is mainly the NAIC model. But yes, I mimic Commissioner Rood's. Um, you know, we've had a lot of good productive meetings with industry um, and, and we're working to get to a better, a better product, but currently as it stands right now, the draft that we've seen just has some, some duplicative language and some contradictions and it just needs a little more work. Is it fair to ask if the, the issue is on, because it's Wyoming and we have some, I know Senator Scott's not here, so I know he'd be asking this. Is it because what he calls, we call home cooking and we have some interesting things in our language that doesn't comply with the Model Act or is it because the Model Act itself when implemented in states is doing weird things? I, I, are we our own enemy, I guess is my question. Mr. Chairman, we do have a travel insurance laws you know we we license the insurers just like uh, any other insurance company and we do license uh, travel agents um, so you know part of it is that the the model itself is not exactly lining up essentially um, with what we have that's not to say I, I don't feel in, a, in our conversations with industry um, you know they've expressed and 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 we expressed as well it was pretty unanimous that our law as it stands right now isn't bad. Um, it, it's very similar to uh, what the NEIC does in terms of licensing. There are some tweaks that industry would pr prefer. Um, so yes, part of it is that it's just not exactly lined up with what we currently have on the books. Let me do one more. So is it fair to say it's a model act? I assume it's coming down the pike eventually. So the, the real question maybe before, well, I guess my question is, is this something in your minds as I'm assuming you're both aware of, we were ever going to possibly implement? Or is this a question of, are we gonna do it this year or three years down the road, but eventually we're probably gonna do it and we're really, we're just talking about time horizon or is there significant concerns where we don't think this is ever going to mesh with Wyoming law and it wasn't something you were ever going to bring before us. Mr. Mr. Chairman, it wasn't on our radar because we've never had industry come and say there's a problem. And when we met with them, they said, we want to just let you know, we like what you got. We just want to change it with the, along, along the model, along with the model so we can say we've got now our 29th state. But the devil's in the details and there's some actually some very big implications for the way our statutes are now that just require more work. And it's not, it's not a model law that has to be passed by the state. The financial model laws have to, those are accreditation standards. This isn't one of them. Further questions from the insurance commissioner? Okay, not seen any. Anyone else in the audience wanna talk about travel insurance? Not seeing any. Um, so it's not required committee, um, but I guess our industry partners have come before us to ask um, if we consider taking this up um, as a, an interim committee bill that the ask is to have it be drafted as an interim committee bill, and then we can work out the details and it's something if Wyoming wants to do. So the motion, if anybody wants to bring one, is to have the standardized language, which I assume Ms. Wilkinson has or is out there have LSO try to draft it and work with the insurance commission uh, for the next couple of months, maybe by our November meeting to get something ready for introduction in 2020-23 session. So I'm looking for motions because frankly, if you don't bring the motion, I assume some legislator is gonna ask for it to be drafted and we're still gonna hear it. So um, Representative or Senator Boner. There a second. Seconded by Duncan. Um, so the motion is to have LSO take the model act and work, I guess, work with the insurance commission, which I'm sure will be happy if we vote yes on this motion to point out the areas of our laws that are not congruent um, or to their satisfaction. And we can decide then at the meeting if it's overwhelming or if it's potentially agreeable that we can resolve issues and get something to move forward. But anyway, the motion is to have us look at it in draft form at our next meeting. All those in favor say aye. Opposed say no. I think that motion overwhelmingly passes. All right. Um, LSO, if you'd have that drafted for our, I guess for our next meeting and then we can, I'll work with the insurance commissioner and 
um, if it's ready for something at August or if it needs some more time for November and it might be a couple of months to work through the issues internally. With that, who else wants to talk about insurance? Yeah. Blue Cross, Blue Shield, how are things going? Good out there in Wyoming? Okay. I don't think we're gonna have a strong fire season this year from the sounds of it up here in the green grass. Anybody else have anything else today they wanna to bring before the legislature in regards to public comment or issues? All right, seeing none, um, Chairman Driscoll is hosting a reception for the legislators and LSO staff and other interested people. If you don't know where that is, please see me after uh, we adjourn and I'll be sure to give you the address and directions. With that, we'll be in recess for the day and 8.30 tomorrow. We'll be back to talk about alcohol and housing.